Welcome everybody to the e-commerce marketing 101 how to grow your DTC brand podcast. I'm very excited to say today that we have Sophie Watson joining us from Dr. Vegan. Hello Sophie. Hi. Um, so Sophie uh, is head of growth for Dr. Vegan who are a UK-based vegan supplement brand for people who want to improve their health without sacrificing their ethics and values. Every product in their lineup speaks volumes to this commitment from formulations rooted in science using clinically studied plant-based ingredients to their plastic-free home compostable packaging. So Sophie came to Dr. Vegan in 2021 and has used a variety of marketing strategies to scale the brand since joining. Sophie, it's so great to meet you. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, how's it going today? How are you doing? Yeah, no, it's really good to be here. Thank you for having me. Um, and yeah, good day so far. Glad to hear it. <laughs> um, okay, so... Let's pretend you've met me at a party and I've asked you the dreaded, so what do you do question. In a nutshell, how would you explain your role at Dr. Vegan? I'm quite lucky to say that I've got quite a broad, varied role. Um, so at Dr. Vegan, I'm head of growth. Um, so that kind of covers any of our acquisition and retention strategies. So obviously don't do this by myself like we have a great team of people supporting me but um you know that could be the paid media marketing um which is kind of like where my career started to our crm um and our kind of um customer messaging that side i also get involved um with the kind of like way we position our brand and who we're kind of talking to so yeah it's really varied but i would say focus is on kind of getting those customers in and then keeping them there <laughs> Yeah, nice. So you're looking across the growth channels, but also once they they are customers, like how do you retain them? Exactly. Yeah, that must be quite an interesting perspective. Like often you see in brands that are like split out like that. It must be quite interesting to see across the entire like customer life cycle. Yeah, definitely. And I think it's like really important that someone kind of has visibility across both. Um, yeah, because you know you might be all well and good at acquiring customers, but if they're not staying. Um, for more than a month, then you're going to have to kind of work double time to keep that revenue because you're always going to have to be acquiring. I think for us, we really focused last year on like improving our retention figures um, just because then it means our acquisition efforts are like way more worth it. We know what to acquire into, how to kind of keep them there. Um, and yeah, it's it's really nice to be able to see that whole picture rather than just focusing on that one area. Yeah, I imagine that must give you a really good understanding of the customer. If you were to say the percentage split of growth, new customer marketing activities to retention marketing activities, what's your balance looking like for you? So we probably do more in terms of acquisition on like a day to day because um, that that activity is a bit more kind of full on in terms of like optimizations on a daily basis. Um, so I would say definitely the percentage is higher in terms of our acquisition activity. Um, but there is, you know, constant stream of emails every week. So we send like two emails every week to our customers. We then have a variety of different kind of um, email flows for that kind of post purchase journey. Um, and then, yeah, we're kind of, there's, all, there's an always on level of activity for those customers and we're always kind of like stopping and looking at where we can like add to that. Um, you know, if there's groups kind of falling out of our um, customer profile, then how can we get them back in? Um, so I would say that one's kind of like a, a more steady trickle of activity, whereas acquisition obviously is a bit more intense. That makes sense and probably where like a lot of the expenditure is as well, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. You first joined Dr. Vegan in 2021 as their growth marketing manager. Um, so going back in time, can you remember what the first challenge you tackled when you were when you first joined the brand? I think working in a startup, things change like all the time. So yeah. I'm, there's been many challenges. But I think the main one when I started was my focus was on like the paid media side um, and driving down the CPA. So um, when I joined, our average CPA was around about £25. Um, now we're a lot lower than that. Um, our target is around like a £16 mark. So it was when I first joined, the real like focus was like, how can we get more efficient in our paid media activity? Um, and then obviously many challenges came along with that, I guess. Yeah. 
what was some of the tactics you employed then in order to drive that CPA downwards? Initially, um, when I joined the, for example, like the Meta account was very broken out um, per product. So when the brand launched, we only launched with a handful of SKUs. We now have like 25 different SKUs. So naturally we can't advertise them all. And I think there was an element that we were kind of, when I joined, we were trying to do that, um, trying to kind of like spread ourselves across every product. Um, and actually it's just spreading yourself too thin. None of your messages get kind of the, they don't land as well because you're kind of too diluted in what you're saying. Um, so one of the first things I did was just restructure the account to like really take advantage of the products that we just could see working. Um, so for example, our menopause product is a really strong seller for us. So I really like focus spend on that product. Um, because whilst we don't just want to target those kind of like older women and we want to have like a broad audience whilst that is working, that was like one of the best ways to kind of help bring our CPA down. And then we could look at other ways of getting the other products to work. But I guess, yeah, when your CPA is so high, like you just need it to come down in whatever way. Um, so that was like my main kind of um, action was just like restructuring to really like focus spend on what we could see was working rather than like spreading ourselves too thin. Interesting. I guess that's kind of making rather than having to like run all those experiments, you already know what's working. So why not double down on it? Once you then get some kind of like revenue in and like the CPA is going down from that experiment that's working, you then have the ability to run extra tests because you already have some activity that you know it's working and you can rely on that to like provide that low CPA and bring that revenue in. And then you can do the tests on like the next products and the next kind of message that you want to push. Um, and I guess it's less of a risk that way. Yeah. Less of a stab in the dark. Yeah, exactly. Do you, have you found often that like the best selling overall products, they usually are the ones to promote or like to make your hero product on paid media or is it not always necessarily the, the case? Um, I think it depends. Um, so for us, when we launched, some of our best sellers were our kind of single ingredients. Um, so like a magnesium and our, or an ashwagandha. Um, but for context, uh, a single ingredient versus a formula like a menopause product is naturally going to cost quite a bit less because there's just one vitamin in there rather than like a formulation. Um, and also people don't necessarily stay retained on a single ingredient product because it's quite hard to say that that is definitely kind of helping a specific need. It's just kind of a general thing that you take. Um, so for us, the products that we focus on in terms of our paid media are actually not just about our hero products necessarily that sell well, but also what products are retained. So our menopause product, thankfully, is one of those. Like people say because it helps their menopause symptoms they see a reduction straight away. Um, we did some research and like 88% of customers like find a difference in their symptoms. So that like we have those kind of stats that show people find the difference. And then obviously you don't want to stop taking that product if it's helping. So uh, we always kind of focus on products that have that retention. Um, and then also that bring in kind of like a decent amount of revenue so that the CPA is like kind of covered and we're making a ROAS on it. Um, so yeah, for us, it is our hero, it is our kind of products that are selling the most, but it's not just that. There are other metrics that we have to consider. Yeah. I guess that's again why it must be really useful having that site from like growth demand gen over to customer retention so you can then feed that back in. Yeah, exactly. Like being able to like know that this product is going to be well retained it's like okay then yeah it makes sense to have it in an acquisition strategy I think without that it's more of a stab in the dark because you know something might be acquired into really well but if they only stay for a month then it's not as worthwhile yeah for sure okay um so sticking with the paid media side of it um at a very top level what is your goal for Dr. Vegan's paid ad strategy? Our main goal, which I'm sure most startups would say, is to drive cost-efficient acquisition. Um, 
I guess that's kind of under the fact that we also always want to kind of remain true to our brand. So we we don't want to just share an ad for the sake of it. We want to make sure that that ad is like kind of getting the point out about um, us and why we're different to competitors. Um, and then also that the customers we are acquiring are those high lifetime value customers and they're not just customers that we're going to lose quickly as well. Yeah. Okay. And what about the... Um how you map out that entire ad funnel like do you kind of break it into stages from like awareness conversion in particular how do you then do that across channels to make sure everything's synced up yeah no we do so for us we are also like a real hub of education for a lot of consumers um we have over 200 blogs on our website about all different health needs and if someone just comes to us for that content and that's great our whole point is we want to kind of educate and inspire people about nutrition and health um so that's fine so a big thing for us is kind of getting visibility across that um kind of content point on our website um so for example on our meta campaigns we always have um uh, traffic campaigns or awareness campaigns that just derive traffic to those blogs and then from there we kind of have mapped it out that in theory we hope that a lot of people will then sign up to our newsletter um, so then they'll kind of be in our funnel obviously then it's likely as well that those customers would then fall into our retargeting campaigns and um, so they're a bit more of like our conversion activity um, and then, you know, we also have the paid search side of things. So that's kind of for when people are then searching for the products that they maybe have read about or maybe heard about through a Facebook ad, or maybe they've seen it um, because they've been on our website and we've kind of said one way you can manage this symptom is through X, you know, they can search for us and they find us again. So that's more like the um, consideration conversion um, part of the funnel. Um we also kind of have other channels, so things like affiliate marketing we're using more and more. So that's really useful for a f- different parts of the funnel, I guess, but definitely like the consideration part of the funnel um, and awareness as well. Because, you know, if we can get ourselves onto like um, credible blogs and people that are speaking about different health uh, concerns or kind of the veganism and kind of recommending different supplements, like being able to be visible there is again just like really important because it drives that awareness that then moves people down the funnel into like the paid social ads that they see on their their feed and then and then back onto the site and can you see how all of the channels relate to each other or is it a lot of kind of searching data together and making some educational educational making some educated guesses it's a bit of both like obviously attribution is the age-old issue for um econ brands um but i think you know there's some natural trends that we see so when we're seeing like strong acquisition through our facebook conversion ads we're also tending to see higher newsletter signups for example because it's likely that someone's seen an ad on facebook they've then signed up to the newsletter they've then gone back a few weeks later or like a week later and converted on that product because they've seen our newsletter messaging. They've probably seen the retargeting ads since then. Um, So we definitely see things kind of go hand in hand um, when we have an ad that goes like slightly viral, I guess, and goes like crazy on Facebook. We definitely see that product start to perform really well on Google as well. So on our paid search activity, because obviously the more people are seeing an ad about product, the more likely they are to search um so yeah we definitely do see like trends in the data just like naturally and then i think there is kind of a bit of stitching together as well because as always like most channels will attribute the sale to themselves and it's working out which part of the kind of funnel played the most significance i guess um i think for us we try and not judge it on like a what's driving the most sales and actually like as long as they're working together well and we're seeing overall numbers increase, then that's kind of like the best for us. And you mentioned affiliate marketing. Is that something that's relatively new to your brand or something that you're like investing more in this year? 
Yeah, so we've been running it for a while, um, but it's kind of always been one of those channels that it requires a lot of manpower, to be honest. Like you you need to kind of have someone always there, reaching out to new publishers, finding new opportunities. Um, so we have definitely always seen the value in it, but it's it's hard to kind of like justify putting more and more kind of resource towards it. So I think um, this year we've done a, a big deep dive into kind of the channels um, kind of what channels are bringing in the most new customers and how we can use different channels to our advantage. So affiliates, for example, has kind of in the data is showing to be really, really strong for subscription purchases. Um, so now our kind of aim for affiliates is to get those subscription purchases up. That's not necessarily what works for like Meta, for example. Meta is more just kind of like those buy once purchases. So we're definitely focusing more on affiliates this year. I think it's going to be in the plan for 2024 to really like double down on our strategy there and kind of start to invest more into it though. Yeah, nice. I've heard a lot more from brands about subscription revenue as well becoming like increasingly important yeah definitely i think obviously it's because it's you know kind of guaranteed um higher higher lifetime value for the customer right like they're kind of signing up so they're gonna stay with you um it's it's definitely a harder sell initially because particularly in supplements people want to know it works before they commit um so for us, it's always kind of been like the secondary push, like we push them to try and then and then to subscribe. Um, but yeah, now we're seeing in the data that subscriptions are coming through quite naturally just from affiliates anyway then. And it, it probably is that kind of credibility piece, like because people are seeing reviews from these like credible publishers. Um, yeah, we're going to try and push it that way so that we've kind of got a channel that's focused on that. Yeah, nice. It was kind of, I guess, similar to what you were saying about first joining pushing your like menopause product because you saw it working already again like you've seen this happening so you're kind of doubling down on making the most of it yeah yeah exactly and I think there is like a lot of things that you can do that you can just you naturally see a trend and then you just double down on that like sometimes like if it isn't broke why fix it like let's just go after that Um, there's no need to reinvent the wheel (laughs) <laughs> exactly and like obviously there's always the argument that we want to find new audiences and find like you know extra incremental customers so obviously we're always trying stuff for that but if you know we want to keep that baseline of customers growing then let's do what's working for that yeah of course how do you find affiliates then so we work with uh awin um so that's like um kind of like the network that we use um and on there any affiliates that's kind of on their directory there's a whole publisher directory that we can kind of search for so we might search for like vegan on there um, and kind of lots of publishers will come up and we'll do a bit of outreach kind of introduce them to the brand I also just do like general searches myself so I might just kind of like have a look online and see if there's any kind of blogs that might be talking about um vegan skincare or vegan hair care for example and then kind of introduce them to awin if they're not necessarily already on that um it's kind of a bit of both um that's why it is a bit kind of resource intensive because you do have to do a lot of like outreach and finding people um what's nice is that now as we've grown as a brand we now get people inquiring to be an affiliate so that's a really nice way that that happens because obviously there's already an actual interest in the brand there's usually they're usually like customers themselves and they want to talk about it to their audiences. So that's starting to kind of pick up as we get bigger. Um, but yeah, it's a lot of outreach on our, our part to get to get those affiliates on board. And do you kind of try different approaches to see what has the most impact of like selling Dr. Vegan to the affiliate? So um, it depends really. Um, we do tend to see that like offering their their audience a discount like an exclusive discount it's like great because obviously affiliates work on commission so if they they have a discount code their customer their audience is more likely to buy and um, obviously that's kind of tricky for us we don't want to always be discounted so that's why noticing that subscriptions are working is good because we can offer like the subscription discount rather than just like any old discount um we also 
tend to find giving samples works really well. So letting our kind of um, publishers try the supplements first, um, that tends to be the natural route for us. Um, we don't want people talking about us that isn't authentic. Um, so I would much rather send out a sample let them try the product and if they love it then they're naturally going to talk about it and talk about it better than if they were to talk about it otherwise it's kind of like reading off a script kind of thing yeah exactly so you mentioned meta what are the main paid media channels that you guys are using currently i would say i think about 80 percent of our performance budget is on meta and the rest is on um google ads we have tried tiktok in the past um and it it worked um it's just keeping it working is quite intensive in terms of creative requirements um, and things like that so we're kind of we paused it whilst cpa wasn't as strong and we're going to go back to that when we have a little bit more resource on board um just so that we can get those kind of creatives um working and ultimately like meta had the better cpa so we as i've said before like double down on what's working yeah Um, for sure yeah so that's kind of what we're doing at the moment that's interesting about tiktok so were you finding that people are getting fatigued quite quickly yeah so definitely tiktok i would say our creative fatigue happened significantly quicker and we needed a lot more videos um like a lot quicker obviously as well on meta like you've got the option of doing like a static image so you know if we notice things are fatiguing our designer can whip up a static ad very quickly getting like a video ad that's going to work particularly previously when we didn't have kind of social media resource in the team and things like that was a lot more difficult so i think yeah tiktok is definitely a lot more creative intense than um other channels so the plan is that in our peak which um is january um we'll be kind of relaunching with tiktok um we've got a lot more resource on the team now um, and we're also using kind of um ugc platforms that allows us to like get creative a lot quicker um so yeah i think we'll be in a much better position to kind of avoid that fatigue and stop that cpa from going up nice so you have someone in-house to do the creative side of it now or at least to help with that yeah exactly so now we have a um social media manager who's great so she's a lot more um able to film a tiktok than like myself and the rest of the team used to be um she's a natural on camera as well which helps no, um, that's always handy <laughs> yeah she's a, she's younger she's in the gen z market so Is she's she? perfect for tiktok she knows what she's doing um yeah so she really knows what she's doing so that's great um and then yeah it just means that we can like roll out videos a lot quicker nice okay cool well look forward to hearing how that goes for you guys um for meta in terms of the creative what types of assets have you seen performing particularly well? Um, so for us, a big one that's working at the moment is it's a video ad, but it's a specific type that's working really well for us. So it's UGC videos, but a compilation. So kind of like edited and stitched all together. So um, we, we've we seen it work like time and time again for different products, kind of like lots of different customers talking about kind of similar benefits stitched all together into quite, like quite a nice storyline. Um, yeah, that's, that's our best kind of performer at the moment, outperforming anything else that we've got live. Nice. Is there a, with the UGC side of it, I think maybe there's a bit of a, um, could be myth or I'm not sure if that's the right word, where you use customer testimonials at more of a, after they're aware of your brand and more of a convert for more of a conversion piece is that does that hold true for you or is that are you saying the opposite yeah so we tend to the videos that have worked the best for us are actual customers who are like loyal to the brand and then they go on and talk about like how great like the product has been for their symptoms and so on and so on and then yeah that works amazingly at getting people to convert um and yeah like for us it's just it's just worked time and time again um in terms of driving sales it's it's very much like i think everyone talks about ugc now being the best kind of way to do it but for us it really is ugc but specifically 
customer testimonials and not just people that you know were paying to do it yeah like actual real people like your prospect audience yeah exactly and how do you get it is it a case of emailing people so we've done both um some of like one of our most successful ways of getting um you see content is basically whenever we see someone comment on a instagram post or an instagram ad or a facebook post like saying oh my god these work for me they're amazing literally like jumping on that and like messaging them straight away and being like hey so glad you love the products like any chance you would do a video um and like what's really nice is that our loyal customers like want to help other people like obviously usually these people are going through like you know a health problem be that like ibs that's like debilitating for them or like menopause that's also like really debilitating like anxiety that's debilitating and they want to help other people with those problems um so usually they're quite receptive to it. Um, we did find that obviously it doesn't necessarily necessarily drive the numbers of videos that we want because a lot of customers will be like, oh, I'll take a photo, but I'm not confident on camera and things like that. So we have started using platforms as well. So we um, are using one platform called Twirl. Um, I think there's another platform that's very similar called Clip. Um, but basically they have like a bank of UGC content creators um, and you basically put a brief up. So we might say we want a one minute video talking about the benefits you felt after taking X product. UGC content creators then have to like pitch themselves to us as a brand. We then pick which ones we want and then they create that content. Um, For some brands, like this can be like literally like a week turnaround. For us, because we want the videos to be authentic, we make them take it for a whole month. Um, so we make them take the product for the month before we even get a review. And if they don't notice any different, we actually, we don't work with them. If they do notice a difference, then we get them to do the review. So it's not as straightforward for us, but I would say that's working well in just terms of like getting the numbers up because it is hard to get your customers to do videos. So to kind of fill those gaps, um, that's how we've been doing it. It's really cool that you have, even with a platform like that, you're still making sure that these people are like authentic advocates. Like it must be kind of tempting, I guess, just to be like, you know what, let's just see how many people we can get in. And, um, but then that's going to drive down the like brand trust, right? Yeah, exactly. And I think from, for like us, I think it's quite obvious when someone hasn't actually tried and loved the product like I think there's like a really distinct difference in the videos that we get um like when people have noticed a genuine difference like they just talk about it so much more naturally like obviously if you like something it's easy to talk about if you never took it and you're just kind of going off what we can see on our website it it feels forced so for us one it's like massive for our like brands like we want to be trustworthy we want to be credible and then two I think just in terms of like the creative working just doesn't work if it's false um i think consumers they're not stupid like they can see through it so yeah it's really important for us yeah i feel like especially the more brands are using it the better everyone's like bs detector gets right to stuff like where it's just not authentic exactly and i think because that every brand does who you see now so i think yeah it's it's very obvious when it's staged and when it's not. Um, so yeah. With the um, paid ad channel, so you mentioned TikTok, you're coming back to that in January. Have there been any channels where you have tried and it just didn't work for you and you were like, okay, like we're never trying this again. This was just a complete disaster. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, for us, like never say never to going back to things. I think that's what I love about like paid media like things change so quickly that a test might not work in 2021 and then this year it might work um off the back off the top of my head um one that I can remember just we just didn't see anything from it was Pinterest um so I think for some brands like naturally it's like a really great channel like it's very aesthetic like I think like homeware for example is probably a really good one for Pinterest like you know people are like pinning things to their board if that's then a shoppable ad like 
perfect. I think for us, and again, like I've said, never maybe in the future it will work and maybe we didn't have the right creative and so on but we just didn't we didn't even see a level of traffic like I think with a lot of tests like we don't necessarily see conversions but we might see traffic but we really just didn't find the audience there um yeah it was like we tested a few different variants of ads and things like that but just it, yeah it really wasn't a success for us yeah and did that surprise you or was that kind of like oh, okay kind of figured it didn't surprise me. I would, I probably would have been more surprised if it was really strong for us. Um, but I could see why it could have worked for us as well. So like I could, I, you know, people do search for like health things on Pinterest, like just like they're pinning like, you know, room inspirations, like people are like pinning like recipes and like, you know, they're like trying to kind of like get healthier, I guess. People make boards on like things to do for that. And um, so I felt like maybe it could have worked, but yeah, just wasn't wasn't right. So it wasn't a huge shock, but a bit disappointing nonetheless. Yeah, fair enough. I think even though we're in different industries, but for like our team as well, even if there's a bit of like a 50%, maybe this channel could work. Let's at least try it. And then you'll either be like validated or pleasantly surprised. Yeah, exactly. And I think like, that's the beauty of paid media right like there's so many channels you can test and it's not a big commitment or you can test like for you know a month two months so that you can get some proper data but it's not like you're not signing up to anything for a year it's not going to cost you hundreds of thousands until you know it's working so it's like it's nice to be able to like try lots of different things um yeah and get results relatively yeah. quickly yeah exactly with the creative angle again is there with your role looking across growth and retention, are there like point data points on the customer of when a customer is converted in terms of like what creative they're responding to maybe in like those um, email workflows that you then feed back into paid media at like at the top funnel? Yeah, I think so for us, it's some of the stuff that works on like email for example like we we know certain articles on our site are really strong with existing customers because we can see that they're clicking through a lot with in those post purchase flows um so that's really like useful data for us because then they're the kind of like articles that we make sure in those like awareness campaigns to drive people to the site um i think as well like we've done a bit of research on our existing customers so we've done um some surveys kind of finding out what it is that made them buy from Dr. Vegan. Um, so we spoke to, I think it was a hundred of our loyal customers and basically like had these phone call interviews, which um, bless our CRM manager, she sit <laughs> onto the team and like did it. And really she, like, 100 had phone some, calls. Yeah. <laughs> and she had some amazing chats um, and she found out some like, you know, amazing case studies, but also it was like really useful because for example, like the two kind of um, key things that came out of it was that people take our supplements and continue to take our supplements because they work. So they're seeing a difference. So that that messaging became like really key for us. So now we've got a whole campaign on feel the difference because that was the motivation behind people staying. And then the other thing that we probably haven't spoken about enough yet was like our sustainability element so um a big thing for loyal customers was like i carry on taking them because i know there's nothing bad in them i take them because i know they're not bad for the environment like i can't get this this like offering elsewhere because like other brands like they use plastic they use glass bottles things like that and um, so it's like all that that insight is really useful um and that's something that we're now trialing in our kind of top of funnel like um paid media activity um kind of trying to use that messaging to get people in because we know that's why they stay we can see how that would make sense like veganism often going really hand in hand with this like deep care for the environment that often being a case for why people are vegan um, can see why that would be successful yeah exactly and I think like for us at the moment what's working on our like top of fun and paid media in terms of like getting customers in is talking about like the symptoms and like 
what symptoms might be resolved and that obviously people are looking for those like fixes to their issues but actually there's like probably a whole audience that we've not even tapped into yet which is that kind of like more sustainable vegan although a lot of our customers aren't actually vegan but like that sustainable part of the audience that really cares about the environment and having their supplements fit into that part of their life so yeah I think that's like a big area that we should start to focus on that in itself must be quite exciting when you feel like there's this whole other opportunity that you're only just beginning to tap yeah definitely I mean I think that's the nature of a startup like they're Obviously, we've like really focused on the menopause audience because that's doing so well for us and we know that they love it. We then recently um, kind of like over over the course of this year have really like scaled up our efforts in like probiotics, for example. And that's like opened up a huge new audience for us because men, women, people under the age of 30, a lot of people are now taking probiotics. So that's like this whole new area to target and then like you say like the sustainability is a new audience again um so I think yeah we're like really lucky that while on one hand it's it's difficult because we have so many different messages we can go down actually it opens us up to so many more customers and potential people to target which is really nice yeah that's super exciting I wanted to just um chat to you briefly before um we close down the episode about your partnership with forest green rovers football club um so talk talk to me a bit about this like what does this mean for your brand why was this a really like important partnership for you guys um so yeah it's something that we're like extremely proud of the conversation has been happening for a while um and you know we really wanted to if we were going to go down the route of like sponsoring someone it to be a team or you know whatever it was that really like, aligned with our values and I think Forest Green Rovers are like the perfect example of that of that um you know the the UK's first vegan football club like they really care like ev- like their stadium everything like it makes a conscious effort to kind of like um be more sustainable be more like environmentally friendly um and obviously like that goes hand in hand with this sustainability messaging that I've been talking about and like that was like an area that we did really want to start pushing more so I think in some ways that was like a really nice reason for us to kind of join up and then the other part was um to kind of provide supplements to sports players obviously gives like another level of like credibility and trust to our customers um so for one reason the supplements have to be informed sport accredited so they have to be um privately batch tested um to check that you know like for doping laws and things like that that they're completely fine for an athlete to take um but obviously then having athletes take them and like take a vegan supplement as well and like show that vegan supplements work just as well was like like such a like great partnership for us because you know like I said it adds that level of credibility um so yeah it's just like something that we're yeah very happy that's like off the ground like we're we're it's something we're very proud of was that a long time in the works like getting everyone to agree like approaching them etc hashing out the contracts and stuff I think the conversation has been happening for over a year potentially even two um because you know from our side it involves things like getting our products and form sport tested which you know isn't an easy process it's very expensive as well as startups to do that but it's something that we were really passionate about because like I said like we want to have that level of credibility and and show our customers that we can be trusted so um there was a lot in terms of like getting things sorted and then obviously we wanted to make sure that like the nutritionists at the club like were like kind of behind our products and actually they were the ones that were really for it like they really wanted our products so that was really nice um for us to kind of see so yeah it was a lot of kind of fine tweaking and making sure that we both kind of um got got what we want out of it but yeah I think we've come to a really nice agreement so yeah yeah. it came good in the end and is is that part of like so you were talking about menopause um your menopause products probiotics is working with a football club a start to like go into another audience maybe of like sports and performance and athletes as well yeah definitely so a big focus area for us in the next kind of six months is definitely to kind of get more men into our base and we naturally I think naturally women 
we see kind of women tend to care more about health from our data anyway that's kind of what we're seeing we see a lot more women signing up to like our diet profile which is like the quiz to find out about your nutrition Um, and then obviously our menopause product naturally means that we have like a high percentage of women in our base so we've kind of like this year really wanted to start focusing on men Um, and there's kind of two ways to do that right so there's the performance like athlete sports kind of side and then um developing a kind of formula for men as well so um we're kind of trying to focus on doing both of those things um but yeah definitely definitely kind of helps us to open up to more audiences yeah nice and how has that partnership have you been using any of the messaging that comes from that partnership in your paid ads as well not yet but that is something that we're kind of looking to do because i think you know the beauty of that partnership as well is just that we get more variations on creative like i think for all of the channels I've spoken about, like variations of creative is like so key. Um, and so what we're hoping to do is kind of get footage of like the players talking about the products, you know, clips of um, them at the ground, clips of the game and kind of weaving that into our paid strategy. Um, and obviously it would be pushing a different product. Um, so yeah, it's definitely something we're looking to do. Obviously the partnership's not been going too long, so nothing's um, kind of, gone yet so i can't share any results but yeah that's definitely in the plan nice okay cool okay well i know this is maybe a bit of an unfair question i know this isn't how marketing works but say you were like stranded on a marketing desert island you could only pick one demand generation channel to keep what would you keep and why to be honest i think i have to say meta ads um i mean i'm probably biased that's like where my career started I was a paid social exec at a large agency first so I've always kind of seen the value in it but I think particularly for a startup it's just so, such a cost efficient way to kind of start um, and like find customers um, I'm not saying long term it's like the be all and end all like I think you really do need to invest in like other brand channels as you grow so that that can be maintained but I think just for that kind of always on triple of customer acquisition it's just like a cost efficient no-brainer really right yeah are you saying especially like if you're scaling that is like the best one to go after currently yeah i mean i guess it depends on your product and what you're selling and who your audience is but facebook well meta facebook instagram covers so much of like the addressable market that there is um so it's a really nice starting starting point um Obviously, it, your your audience might not be there, but for us, it definitely is. So. Yeah, for sure, that that helps, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, what about other brands with their paid social strategy? Are there any that you think are like doing particularly well currently? Maybe you go to for inspiration when you kind of want to come up with new creative ideas. Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's loads. I think so. I use Facebook Ad Library. I'm not sure if you've heard of it, but I use that like all the time um, to get new ideas and, you know, come up with different ways that we can be showcasing our message. I think brands off the top of my head that have always, from what I can see, done it really well. Um, Estrid, um, they're a razor company. Um, I've I've been targeted with their ads for years now um, and it worked. I converted, so it obviously, <laughs> obviously worked. Um, but I think they have like the perfect mix of like they have UGC. They also do some like um, influencer kind of creative like on their own channels. They also do like really simple statics which show like their key USPs. And I think throughout all of them, there's always like a clear brand. Like I always know it's an Astrid ad. Um, so I think they're like really great. Um, I think a brand actually that in the past six months, seems to have just come out of nowhere I'd literally never heard of them before and then all of a sudden like I cannot escape them it's a brand called <laughs> Mella um so they're there's Mella yeah so okay. they're a sunglasses brand um they seem to be doing amazingly through meta ads to be honest like I I think since like March I've been getting their ads and I've seen like all of a sudden, like I've seen so many people in London wearing these Mella sunglasses, which I never even heard of before. Um, but they just like 
like they're creative like they pretty much only use statics which is different to a lot of people like a lot of the kind of messaging around paid media at the moment is like videos king like always use video UGC content but actually they tend to use statics it's usually proper shoots it's not UGC um but it's just like so clear like they also tend to have a really good deal it's usually two for one but it's always just so clear the message it's clear who the brand is um and yeah I just think they do they do it really well what advice would you give to somebody in your position I think test everything um and when I say test everything like don't just test what everyone else says works like UGC might work for you might not work for someone else like you know don't just test the things that people say to test like test any idea you have and then (laughs) something that I seem to have said a lot today double down when you know it's working when you find something that works go for that don't dilute yourself I think there's always a temptation of like in startups that's like running every channel but I think my preferred approach is like run a channel and run it well and then find another channel like until until you've got a channel that's working really well don't dilute your message yeah nice okay wonderful thank you well that is the end of all my questions so thank you so much for joining us it's been a pleasure chatting to you and I think there's going to be a lot of stuff that we've covered there that will be useful for our listeners um yeah so thank you so much for joining us and have a great day oh thank you thank you for having me it's been great oh you're very welcome thank you so much for listening to e-commerce marketing 101 how to grow your dtc brand if you enjoyed this episode don't forget to subscribe to the series for actual tips you can use in your own e-commerce marketing this podcast series is brought to you by dash If you need to get your visuals in front of potential customers faster, or you're sick of spending too much time sending assets to your retail partners, then we might have just what you've been looking for. Take your leave from leading e-commerce brands like Passenger Clothing and check out Dash.app. Just go to Dash.app to take out our free trial and try it for yourself.